welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today, it's so great to have Chloe Valdry on the podcast. After spending a year as a Bartley Fellow at the Wall Street Journal, Valdry developed the theory of enchantment in an innovative framework for social emotional learning, character development, and interpersonal growth that uses pop culture as an educational tool in the classroom and beyond. Chloe has trained around the world, including in South Africa, the Netherlands, Germany, and Israel. Her clients have included high school and college students, government agencies, business teams, and many more. She's also lectured in universities across America, including Harvard and Georgetown. Her work has been covered in Psychology Today magazine, and her writings have appeared in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Chloe, so, so glad to finally chat with you. Likewise. Well, where do, where do we even begin? <laughs> There's so many, so many potential starting points, but if it's cool with you, I'd love to start with your theory of enchantment. I'm enchanted with it as a, <laughs> I know I'm so corny, but anyway, I, I, I am enchanted with it because I, uh, you know, I, I have a deep interest in education and, and making sure that no kids fall between the cracks. And I just love mm-hmm. to hear how your program addresses some of those issues and, and just, you know, what inspires you most about that work that you do. Sure. So Theory of Enchantment is a social emotional learning program that I designed about a year and a half ago. And it comes out of my my desire to construct a framework to teach people how to love using the things that we already love and that we already gravitate towards. So things like pop culture, for example, because I believe that there are narratives within our pop culture that teach people how to believe in their own sense of self-worthiness, believe in their ability to overcome obstacles, to endure hardship. Um, and so by blending those elements of pop culture that teach these lessons with ancient wisdom, my theory is that you can teach people how to love themselves and then in the long run, be able to get along with and love others. And I'm really inspired and motivated by especially getting it in as many schools as possible, but really uh, young people, teenagers, and adults. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for, for the possibility of seeing how many people become enamored with this approach. So, how many years have you been doing that? Like, when did you create the program? So, I created it formally a year and a half ago. Right on. And so, how old are you right now? I'm 26 at the moment. Cool. And um, yeah. So, let's back up a little bit about your history. So, uh, yeah. what was your major in college? My major was international studies with a concentration in diplomacy. Oh, inter- oh wow. That's going to come in handy now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, very nice. I think so. <laughs> you're, you, you're applying it. Well, I want to say you're applying it on Twitter. You're applying those yeah, principles. Definitely uh, trying my best. <laughs> yeah. It's much, much needed. More, more people like that on social media and, and in the world uh, broader. So when did you get interested in education. So what was the point before you created this program where you're like, wow, there really yeah. is this need? So basically after I graduated, I graduated in 2015 and then I moved to New York in uh, the summer of 2015 because I got a job at the Wall Street Journal. So I was at the Wall Street Journal for a year working on the op-ed desk. And um, for nine months while I was there, I worked on a thesis that ended up being the catalyst for theory of enchantment. And I was trying to, again, figure out how to create a framework for teaching people how to love within the context of conflict and diplomacy, because that was my background. Um, But there was no framework that specifically and explicitly laid this out. Like, how do we get people to learn how to love? There were frameworks of how do we get people to stop fighting each other, but not necessarily, you know, to start loving each other. So I I created a thesis, came up with a theory and then lectured on that thesis for two years. Uh, And then increasingly, when I would lecture, I would get the response from parents and from people from all walks of life uh, saying, hey, this isn't just applicable within the context of conflict resolution. It's also applicable within the context of social emotional learning in the classroom. But when you're talking about high schools, when you're talking about interpersonal matters, when you're talking about just trying to create a society with more human flourishing in general. So you might want to consider taking 
what you've done and expanding upon it and building upon it and developing it into a full course. So enough people told me that and I decided to run with it. Awesome. It's, I see some parallels there with the field of positive psychology that I work in where mm -hmm. we don't treat moving from negative 10 to zero as you're being done. Mm -hmm. When you go to see a therapist, it's like you come in with a therapist, I'm anxious, I'm anxious. And your, your goal really isn't just to not be anxious anymore in life. If you actually ask mm -hmm. people what do you actually want in life, it's much more than that, right? Sure. So I see some great uh, confluence there. Also see great confluences in our interest with humanistic psychology and the idea of at, at its base, we all have fundamental human needs. We all want the mm -hmm. same thing. And, and looking beyond really superficial characteristics of a human to really get at the character. I think character is something that's really important to you and a part of your value system. Definitely. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the first things that we teach in the theory of enchantment is the first principle, which is treat people like human beings, not political abstractions. But then we have to do the work of educating people on actually what it means to be a human being, uh, what it what it means to have to navigate this human condition with all of its imperfection, um, with all of the suffering that's a part of that comes with life because we are mortal. And so that's inevitable that there will be suffering in life. So how do we uh, how do we shore up ourselves um, and shore up our sense of self and agency and build up our character so that we can endure the hardships of life and even transcend back to the word that you love um, those those hardships and character building is a is a key part of that uh, character development resiliency development is definitely a key part of that. What about uh, uh, this is a buzzword in the education field social emotional learning. Yeah. So what um, how do you target that. So I would say that a lot of uh, thinking about social emotional learning in today's high schools comes from um, a belief in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and <laughs> uh, I, uh, that was a good that was a good uh, signal, um, you know, all about self-actualization. And, and I, actually, in the wake of COVID-19, there have been many schools because I follow a lot of school blogs, education blogs. Mm. There have been a lot of. Uh, <laughs> high school, all of a sudden realizing that, oh, SEL is like primary. It's not a secondary thing. A student is not going to be able to learn math if their sense of self, if their sense of social emotional well-being is out of whack. Um, and so, yeah, with the, with the idea that ultimately um, the student's sense of self-actualization needs to be nurtured um, I think that's what social emotional learning is meant to do. And that's that's something that's certainly an objective that my program is is uh, trying to accomplish in the lives of its students. Awesome. And you also teach anti-racism through the lens of developmental psychology and the study of texts by Baldwin, uh, Maya Angelou, Obama and others. How did how did you like come about that curriculum? Because there are other different uh, yeah. approaches, shall we say, to anti-racism than your approach. Mm -hmm. How did you? What inspired you to, to, to go down this path? So what's interesting is that it's only uh, it, it's only coincident. It's almost coincidental that my my uh, program happens to also be an anti-racism program. Um, and in that sense, I mean that, yes, like the, the rich texts that the theory of enchantment pulls from to teach character development happen to be uh, texts from some of our most uh incredible leaders um, in the contemporary sense. And some, and many of those incredible leaders are African-American. Uh, and so they include James Baldwin, as you said, Dr. Maya Angelou, um, Ralph Ellison, uh, and, and others, and Dr. King, who's, whose writings we also teach um, in the course. And so in that sense, I teach anti-racism in, a, a, I think, a far more integrated way than some of what I've seen online, some of the programs that I've seen being um, promoted. Uh, and part of the first, this goes back to the first principle of the theory of enchantment. Part of what we teach to supplement that is uh, to teach people how to not caricature each other, to teach people how to not stereotype and reduce each other to immutable characteristics like race. Um, and Baldwin had a lot to say about this. Oh Dr. my God, Maya I love Angelou. Baldwin. Can I just say that real quick? Sure. Yeah. I saw your, I'm not your Negro. I think that was the title of the documentary. Yeah. I saw that again the other day and I was like bawling the entire time. Like, I just, I kind of fell in love with him. I don't know if I'm yeah. allowed to say that, but I really did. And, <laughs> you definitely are. <laughs> like in, yeah. a, in, in a, like, you know, uh, in, in, in a deep uh, sort of a human connection sort of way, you know? Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. Baldwin was an artist. Many people don't necessarily think of him in that way, but I think in his most 
in the most purest sense, above all, uh, beside being a critic and a, beside being a social critic, a writer, an author, he was an artist. And and in my mind, the the purpose of art is to teach people how to create order out of chaos and to create meaning out of chaos uh, and meaning out of suffering. And that's what he did in his writing. So we teach um we teach two pieces by Baldwin. We teach the fire next time, and we teach everybody's protest novel, which was a piece published in 1948, one of his earlier pieces. So yeah, Baldwin is like considered pretty sacred in the theory of enchantment universe. Um, but, but, you know, I have to say, like, I feel like there have been a lot of people promoting Baldwin who haven't necessarily read Baldwin. Same with Martin uh, Luther King, right? <laughs> yeah. And who haven't like seriously studied them in depth and parsed their writings and really wrestled with their writings. Yeah. Um, and that's what we encourage in the theory of enchantment uh, curriculum. So I just love that. Hey everyone, I'm excited to announce that the Psychology Podcast is expanding. I've decided to work full time to make this podcast the best possible experience for you all. So now in addition to our regular schedule of publicly available episodes, we will also be adding additional episodes exclusive for Patreon subscribers. I think you're really going to love our new exclusive content. And if we reach our monthly goal, we will donate 10% of all proceeds to an organization dedicated to helping people with their mental health. You can check out the Psychology Podcast Patreon page by going to patreon.com slash psychpodcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash psychpodcast. Okay, now back to the show. Another element of your course is to build holistic, transformational relationships with others. And here, here's, the, here's, the, here's the big part. Even yeah. with those you find, even, even, even with those who you may disagree. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. Is, that, <laughs> is that possible? Can you actually have transformative relationships with people that you disagree? Yeah, I mean, before our po- our politics became a sort of uh, religious identity that we <laughs> that we associated ourselves with, that we attached ourselves with so fervently, um, which I think is a relatively recent thing in our society. Um, I think it was easier. First of all, we were even even in our political silos, we were more closely aligned um, with each other in the past. And we also were more willing to have conversations where we disagreed with each other nicely. But this logically follows this idea of not caricaturing each other, because once you understand what it means to be a human being, that we're all carrying uh, imperfections and insecurities and trying to, to fulfill our untapped potential you can be able to see where another person is coming from, even while disagreeing with them. And that will make the disagreement less personal, I think. And therefore, you will not feel the need to identify so fiercely with your own position or to put it in a better way, um, a, a person's disagreement with you, whether it's of a political nature or otherwise, um, will not threaten your sense of identity because your sense of identity is secure. Um, and if it's secure, then there's nothing that anyone can say or do to thwart that or to undermine that. And to take an extreme position, an extreme example of this is Daryl Davis. And uh, Daryl Davis is an individual who is, in addition to being an amazing musician, um, his claim to fame is also that he basically gets members of the KKK to leave the KKK. Mm. Um, and I interviewed him in the Theory of Enchantment podcast, which people can check out online. Um, but I, I asked him, how do you handle this when like they're yelling, obviously racist things at you when they first meet you? And he's like, I get this question all the time. And I say to I, my my whole thing is like, but what does that have to do with me? That has nothing to do with me. Like, yeah. I know who I am. I, I know what they're saying is wrong. That has that has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with them. And I went, huh. That's a great answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. Such a good answer. Yeah. So why do you refuse to avoid white people? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that I was not the person to pick that title for that piece in the New York okay. Times. Fair. Uh, fair. We, we, we've all been there with people. Disclaimer, titles. disclaimer. No, but like, I don't, you know, I don't really relate to this uh, new wave of vocabulary that's being, that's being uh, promoted in and certain quote unquote anti-racist spaces that, look at white people as like a conglomerate or a monolith or a political abstraction. 
Um, you know, I grew up around all kinds of people, black people, white people, Asians, Hispanics. Um, I grew up in a very multicultural environment and mm. I grew up engaging with individuals as human beings. So I really don't, it's not even that I, you know, quote unquote, disagree with the approach that some have taken when it comes to forming relationships with, you know, folks of other backgrounds, that's very like, again, caricatured and stayed and, and, mm. um, really, uh, objectifying i it's not even that i disagree with it it's that it's a foreign concept to me i cannot fathom that that doesn't make any sense to me it's like a i can't i can't even um yeah i can't make sense of it so so this this is a word that that's that's used a lot these days woke (laughs) w-o-k have you heard of it (laughs) yes good question (laughs) so yes i mean obviously you've heard of it i'm just joking but is this something is that word is that a part of your identity what are your thoughts? What's your relationship to that word? No. So the short answer is no. But the long answer is that woke is just a euphemism for the term enlightened. It's just a synonym. Mm. That's what people are trying yeah. to say. They're trying to say that they're enlightened beings, which is teeming with irony, right? Because there are a lot of... Don't get me started if you want me to lay it all out for you. There's, yeah, no. there's, so, many, there's so many layers of irony. One of the layers of irony is that there is this movement right now in certain small circles. I don't think it's a majoritarian uh, movement, but there's this movement that says we have to tear down the statutes of people, not of people who have represented, for example, horrible things like the promotion of slavery and whose statutes were put out precisely to celebrate their promotion of slavery. And, and that's, of course, the Confederate statutes. So I'm not talking about those, but there are others who say that we have to tear down every statute of every person from the past that represented sort of America, um, whether or not the statute was put up in their honor to celebrate their good virtues. And they're doing this in the name of being woke. And they're doing this in the name of sort of uh, of casting off their quote unquote Western slash uh, European past. And what's ironic about this is that, again, the very concept of wokeness comes from a culture that is steeped in an obsession with the Enlightenment. And so you cannot, Mm. even even in the attempt to tear down your past, you're upholding your past, you're upholding this tradition of the pursuit of Enlightenment. And so it's wrapped up, it's wrapped up in its rejection. Um, So that's only one element of irony. Um, But the point, the, the, the major point is that one cannot cast off their past. One is a product of their past, whether one wants to, uh, you know, admit that or not. And that's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, And so that's, again, going back to the first principle, what we teach about what it means to be a human being is to have the capacity to do good and the capacity to do evil. This is always true. This is not something that is exclusively true about the past or people from the past. This is true about us human beings in the present, and it will always be true for us in the future. So our goal should be to keep ourselves and our our minds and our souls intact, to develop our our character, to have a moral ethic at the center of our movements, and to try to pursue that moral ethic. Um, but but if we are going to tear down relics of the past because those relics because they represent individuals who also sinned, uh, I'm sorry to be the one to tell people this, but we too will and have sinned uh, in the present, and we will sin in the future because we are human beings. (laughs) Um, And so the question is not, you know, how to be perfect. The question to sum up one of the main tenets of the book East of Eden, which is also taught in the theory of enchantment is now that, you know, you cannot be perfect. You can strive to be good. That is the point. I just love that. Uh, Another irony is that the idea of enlightenment, see, I didn't even connect it to the, uh, that that period of human history, the Enlightenment period, mm-hmm. I connected it to the Buddha <laughs> when mm-hmm. I when I heard that word and kind of enlightenment that uh, Zen Buddhists talk about or or monks, mm-hmm. you know, who spend their whole lives meditating, is one where there is a oneness with all mm-hmm. of the rest of humanity. Yes, <laughs> and and that was another irony I I, I know yes. is that it, it seems like in a lot of a woke ideology, there's um, the spirit isn't necessarily one of oneness with all of humans, you know, right. So I thought that's it's a, it's certainly a bastardization of the term. I actually just read my first book on Buddhism, on tantric Buddhism called Journey Without Goal, 
Are you familiar with that with that text? No, but it sounds like something I would be it interested was, in. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was very it was very interested. I actually got it because I got it because I was watching Tron randomly, the I Disney love that movie. movie. I and love they that movie. <laughs> but it was not the old version though, like the, the latest one. Three D. Um, I saw it in three D. That's oh, cool. Oh, there's a yeah, the latest one in three D. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's I mean, it's like from an aesthetic perspective, it's beautiful. But one of the books that the main character mentions that he was sort of like meditating on and reading was that book. I immediately ordered it on Amazon. Um, but yeah, no, there's an absence of this oneness or the sense of one oneness with the rest of humanity, um, unfortunately. And that you can't. That, I mean, without that, there's not going to go well let me tell you (laughs) no no no. it's not going to go well (laughs) that's right that's exactly right um so let's uh you you just published a piece i believe at usa today Mm -hmm. and you said this is a quote from it which i uh i tweeted this quote because i loved loved it this attempt to correct injustice is laudable but the work of anti-racism must be rooted in the moral ethic of love and acknowledge the profound sacredness of human beings. Before um, uh, you elaborate on it, I just want to note a connection between that quote and uh, and 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 what really some of the work I, I really fascinates me. And I've been trying to um, get Abra- you know Abraham Maslow was a humanistic psychologist who created that hierarchy of needs. But people don't realize towards the end of his life that he argued that self actualization wasn't the highest motivation. It was actually self transcendence, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. he viewed self transcendence a big part of it. As and there's a great quote of his, um, which I would bastardize if I tried to remember it right now, but I'll send it to you <laughs> off, yeah, sure. yeah, please later, do. later. But it's basically self actualization and self transcendence is really about respecting the uniqueness and sacredness of another human being, no matter how different it may be from yours. Mm-hmm. And that's really, you know, some people like talk about self actualization as though it's this really selfish thing and, and, mm-hmm. and they misattribute his ideas in that way, and, and it couldn't be farther from the truth. He actually saw self act like you're never fully self actualized unless you you try to you appreciate the self actualization of another human. But yeah, I just wanted to put a, that forward. Yeah, yeah, that's a really that's a really beautiful um, that's a really beautiful point. I think uh, yeah, I think you know this sort of sort of goes to the idea that that no human being is an island, right? And so so we need nurturing of ourselves, but we also need to be connect it with one another. And actually one of the things I think that's plaguing our society, and this is in part because of the byproducts of COVID-19, um, is this inability to physically connect with each other, um, to be in, in spaces with each other, to, to have a presence with each other. One of the things I'm personally missing is like music and, and, and dance and concerts and things like that, because that is where I get a lot of my uh, spiritual nourishment is being in spaces with other people where we can actually connect over music. Um, and so because that has been uh, decimated because of COVID-19 and there's no experience of synchronicity and there's no experience of physical connectedness between individuals, um, we're, we're lashing out, I think, in, in some ways that are, that are very harmful. And I think that that reflects that teaching by Maslow. Completely in it. And you're, it also uh, reflects your own philosophy. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to announce that for the first time ever, I'm taking my Columbia University course online. Starting September 5th, my eight-week online course will help you live a more fulfilling, meaningful, creative, and self-actualized life. Deeply grounded in the core principles of humanistic and positive psychology, the course will help you in your own personal journey to realize your greatest strengths and become more fully human accepting and becoming flexible with the totality of who you are so that you can become the person you most want to become. Save your spot today by going to transcendcourse.com. That's transcendcourse.com. Save your spot today and join us. It's going to be really exciting and I'm really looking forward to getting to know folks and helping them realize their full potential. Okay, now back to the show. You say to humanize a person is to treat them in a way that honors this complexity. Why do you think humans have such this tribal tendency that that overrides their ability to see greater complexity? It's almost like it's a more powerful innate drive than the drive to transcend it. So it's a great question. I would say based upon my experience, I think that human beings, societies aren't always exposed to the fact that we can transcend, that we are capable of transcending. I think that the media plays a a really 
unfortunately negative role. I won't say the media as if it's a monolithic, you know, thing because I use so much media in theory of enchantment. So that would, (laughs) that would be unfair. But I think that, I think that we're siloed and a lot of the media that we are exposed to is only uh, showing us those tribalistic tendencies is only showing us our capacity to descend into um, our base instincts. And it doesn't show us enough um, our capacity to transcend and and one of the reasons why I put so much pop culture in the theory of enchantment uh, curriculum is to get those images and get those stories um, and and get those you know musical compositions that capture human beings working together, overcoming overcoming conflict um, in in incredibly enchanting ways. So as to remind people that this is possible, and the idea is that if if I can do that enough, and if I, if I can put enough images out there, you know, <clears throat> online that remind us of our common humanity, then we will begin to act in a way that reflects our common humanity. But I think that that the media parts of the media play a huge role in that. This is really interesting. Do you think that sometimes the very well-intentioned, well-meaning drive from a lot of people in the Black Lives Matter movement to to illustrate or to talk about race issues? Can that backfire sometimes in the sense it can make us even more paranoid or more focused on the issue mm-hmm. of race than, than maybe we even have been before in a way that might not be beneficial? I'm just curious mm-hmm. if you thought that, thought that through. And I phrase that very sensitively because I'm not trying yeah. to be a provocateur at all. I'm trying to think it through, you know? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think one of the reasons why we teach James Baldwin's Everybody's Protest novel is precisely to warn against this because Baldwin wrote about this very phenomenon um, in 1948 at a time when there were a lot of protest novels coming out, uh, quote unquote, protest novels that were quote unquote anti-racist, um, but that actually caricatured both blacks and whites. Um, and this was this was his point. This, his point was that this is a problem. This is stereotyping both races. This is reducing both races to these immutable characteristics. And the failure of the protest novel lies in its rejection of the human being. And this is mm-hmm. sort of like, I think this is more or less a quote. He said, the, the failure of the protest novel lies in its rejection of the human being and his power and his beauty and in his dread. And it, it is it, it lies in its re- insistence that it is a human being's uh, category alone, which is real and which cannot be transcended. So yes, I think that Ooh, there is. Did a, he use the word transcended? He said transcended. Oh, yeah, that's, that's my boy. I feel like that's my boy right there. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a. That's why I love to emphasize how much of an artist Baldwin was. Wow. But um, and I think that it's the artist, the true artists, that really understand this. Um, Ralph Ellison, of course, also talked about this a lot in his writings. But um, so yeah, I think there is a danger. It's important to highlight injustice, um, and when it when it happens along racial lines, but we must not lose sight of the fact that if we reduce each other in the name of ending that injustice, we will be at risk of perpetuating the very thing that we're trying to end. Um, And I think it's what's insightful to think about also here is the Smithsonian African American Museum in D.C. Um, I was having a conversation with a friend about this the other day. Um, What's brilliant about that museum and the way it's designed is that Um, It starts out, so it has four floors, there's four floors, and it starts out, the bottom floor is really about, mostly about slavery and the experience of slavery. There's a little bit about the civil rights movement as well, um, but I think that the the most compelling part is about slavery. And then the second floor is about Black enterprise, Black education, Blacks in the military. The third floor is about, gives you the opportunity to um, explore on your own, so explore whatever topic that you want to dive deeper into. But the fourth floor is about art. And it's about all of Black representation in the arts, from music to dance to cooking to um, TV, entertainment, comedy, film. And what's brilliant about that, I was like, oh, these guys, they did this on purpose. What's brilliant about this is that it is literally designed to transcend from (laughs) from slavery. But each floor is a different (laughs) level of the hierarchy of needs. (laughs) Yes, yes. Yes, and each and it's like from slavery to the art. Yeah, and it's from a, lack it's a of brilliant... safety to self-actualized transcendence. Yeah, it's a it's a brilliant commentary not only on African American life but on the human spirit and mm. the ability of the human spirit to rise above. To so. rise above. 
Well, you did. I, I literally just got to chill. <laughs> Amazing. So. That's the that's the goal of entrapment. <laughs> yeah, it's just working. Got, got chill. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I, I can't a hundred percent emoji con, emoticon more what you just said. <laughs> I've started to think in terms of emoticons because I got my new yeah. touch bar for my new MacBook, and at the top, oh, nice. when you How type anything, that? there's yeah. a, there's an emoticon that automatically shows up for anything you type. So now yeah. I've been starting to overuse emoticons. That's cool. Love, 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 heart, 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 heart. Yeah. 100%. Anyway, that was a digression, but <laughs> love what you just said. And then the final part of this article you wrote for USA Today is about a, a push for inclusive policies. You say, will we push for policies that reflect the spirit of democracy, that seek out the well-being of all, black and white, civilian and cop, poor and rich, conservative and liberal? I love that. But that way of thinking really requires us to transcend a zero-sum way of thinking. It Mm -hmm. seems like that zero-sum way of thinking is what's prevalent right now. Mm -hmm. Um, How can we get people to kind of see that promised land, so to speak, that you, you outlined there? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, societies begin to start thinking in zero-sum ways when there's a great deal of scarcity. And um, again, this is exacerbated by COVID-19, the fact that we're dealing with so many issues right now, whether it's from an economic issue, we're dealing with poverty, unemployment, um, we're dealing with people, people perceiving their livelihood is going on there. People's actual livelihoods are going on there. We're dealing with all of these perception issues. And again, for me, it goes back to, to the perception issue because perception is reality. And so for, in terms of what I can do as a human being and, and with my company theory of enchantment is to change the perception by putting out these images, by putting out these videos, by engaging folks in the theory of enchantment course so that they, can begin to imagine that their lives are far less narrower than than it than it actually seems right now, and that there is far more potential um, than it actually seems right now. So that's what I try to do, at least um, in the you know in the articles that I create. Um, and and it's 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 useful to study. You know, I quote King at length in that piece. Um, it's useful to study those who have come before us who had to endure incredible discrimination, racism, hardship. And it's, it's crazy to me because it's like, obviously, if these people of incredible moral strength, moral fiber and caliber were able to have this wide, expansive view of humanity yes. <laughs> and of our ability to transcend, then surely we in 2020 can adopt some of their outlook and arm ourselves with the love and the grace that they arm themselves with. I mean, we are we are on one hand dealing with incredible problems of scarcity um, but on the other hand, we're nowhere. It's I think it's no way in no way, shape, or form comparable to what you know many who came before us endured. Um, and so this speaks to us to a yes, a economic impoverishment, but also to a spiritual impoverishment that we're dealing with right now. And I hope that theory of enchantment can speak to that and help change that. I love that. And you know, technically. It- someone could make the case there's more slavery around the world on mass now sure. than there was in 1870. So it seems like we, ha- we, we, there's a lot to address in this world, right? Yeah. Writ large yeah. and really ge- getting it, you know, great. I love what you're saying. And I thought maybe we can transition to some Twitter questions. Okay, sure. <laughs> I don't know if you saw. Oh boy. <laughs> did, did you see that I put up a call today for. I did see that. Yes. Yeah, anyone. Yes. What do you want to ask Chloe? Um, so here's some things. John asks, what's your view on cultural Marxism and the reductionist <laughs> attitudes that increase polarization? I mean, that those are two separate questions. I feel like polarization. I think I've, I've spoken to a little bit earlier in this, in this talk, cultural Marxism. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. So I would have to ask him to expound upon that. If he's asking me what I think about Marxism <laughs> in general, yeah. um, I think that what Marx lacked in his political philosophy was a sense of the existential. Um, The existential piece was missing from his philosophy. The sense of the metaphysical was missing from his philosophy. Camille Paglia talks about this in some of her writings. Um, There's no sense of the expansiveness uh, of human life um, in his philosophy. Um, And there's no sense of the spirit of the of the existence of the of, of the spiritual life and inner life that exists in his philosophies, so which is 
which is why there's an irony in calling for material solution to what is fundamentally a spiritual problem. Um, so that's that's what I would say in a nutshell, because I can't really have a three hour conversation about Marx right now. But that's what I would, that's what I I would say. That. Either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I would say. Um, that isn't to say that some of his observations about the about a hyper consumerist society, you know, wasn't accurate. But I think a lot of his solutions were off. So great, Michelle Carroll, who used to host the wonderful Exploring Minds show. I'm a big fan of Michelle Carroll, so I thought I'd plug her a little bit. She asked, would, would love to know how maintaining a constant presence on social media and exploring sensitive topics has affected your mental health and life online. How do you handle the toxicity of trolls slash haters that comes with a growing audience? Great questions for yourself as well, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. It's a learning curve, especially as I as it seems my social media platforms have been taking off in the past few weeks. So this is something very new to me. I definitely am going to try to build a team as I build the Rio of Enchantment so that I won't have to be on social media as much as possible so I can export that duty to a team that can handle it. Um, so if anyone's listening to this podcast and would like to be interested in helping me with that, please feel free to reach out. But I also like, you know, try to engage in my own forms of practice. I meditate for an hour every single day. I try to read every single day, like do some long form reading for two hours every day. And I also try to practice dance and making music on my uh, at least once a week, um, whether that's actually producing music or playing guitar um, and or dancing. So those are some of the ways that I try to maintain sanity and balance and stay off my phone as much as possible. <laughs> I think that's very, very smart. Mm -hmm. Very smart. Hey, everyone. If you find the themes we cover on the Psychology Podcast interesting and enlightening, you might be interested in my new book, Transcend, The New Science of Self-Actualization. The book is the culmination of my journey to scientifically discover the factors that can lead us to optimal health, growth, creativity, peak experiences, and deep fulfillment. I believe we can still manage to have peak experiences, the most wondrous moments that make life worth living regardless of our current life circumstances. We can choose growth. For more, you can visit transcend-book.com. That's transcend-book.com with a hyphen between the word transcend and the word book. If you get a chance to read the book, it'd be great if you could leave a review on Amazon, tweet about it, or share the book with friends. I truly hope this book can help people get through these tough times and realize that we all have greater resiliency, creativity, and potential within us than we ever realized. Okay, now back to the show. Jacob Forensic asked some questions which you may not want to answer, and if you don't, I'll just edit it out. I totally respect that. Okay. One is, what problems she has with David Rubin? That, oh. That's one question. And the second question, yes. and I'll, I'll just answer, I'll put to both questions and feel free to pass on both of them. The second one, it, this is a double whammy. <laughs> what would you tell Candace Owens on her intentional misinforming of the public for personal political gain? Do you want to respond to either of those two? So I'm not going to respond to the Dave Rubin one, but I, I will respond to the Candace okay. Owens. My message to Candace Owens is, first of all, that there's there's a lack of internal moral consistency in her message. So I was actually thinking about this the other day. One of the things she does, one of the things she did was she talked about uh, some of the flaws or sins, so to speak, of of George Floyd. Um, she talked about George Floyd's rap sheet, for example, and um, suggested that that rap sheet, that criminal rap sheet should, should sort of um, stop us from make, turning him into a martyr. Uh, and there, there's so many, there's so many things here because, you know, it's ironic because on the one hand, Kenneth Owens talks about criminal justice reform um, which is rooted in this idea that the worst thing that you do shouldn't shouldn't define you. You shouldn't be defined by the worst thing you've done. So on the one hand, she's promoted that. And on the other hand, she says that this sin that George Floyd committed should stop him from being um, a symbol of a, a lot of our protests. And I think that, that, that it's telling that there's a contradiction in that, number one. But number two, the other mo more glaring thing that she does um, is that she she points out the sins of, you know, these individuals very, very readily. But then when it comes to asking 
you know, seeing conversations she's been engaged in about Thomas Jefferson or Christopher Columbus. Um, she, it's a very e- simple and easy sort of write off. It's, it's like, oh, well, yes, they did all those things, but they, but they, you know, discovered the new world when, in the case of Christopher Columbus, um, or they, you know, uh, talked about, or they wrote the Declaration of Independence um, in the case of Jefferson. And I think what I would say is that we need to be internally and morally consistent here. Um, if we can, if we have to be able to hold both the sins and the saintliness of individuals across the board, um, whether they're uh, in the contemporary sense or whether they come from our past, whether they're black or whether they're white. Um, and I think that what Candace Owens lacks is an, is an ability to do that across the board. And I would also say that she's selective in the grace that she extends to, to people. I um, mean, it does seem to it does seem to me to be rooted in, in a political objective. Um, and she she's more far more willing to extend grace to those she considers to be in her own camp than those that are outside of it, which is not the definition of grace. <laughs> that's not what that's not what great grace is by definition, extending it to folks who don't belong in your camp, in your community, in your and how you choose to see yourself. So that would be how I would I would I would challenge Candace on that. And I would I would challenge her to think more nuanced in that way. So Thanks for offering your thoughts on that. Maybe I'll get both of you on the podcast sometime to <laughs> hash it out. Yeah, good luck. Good luck with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to try. Um, so I, well, I have a question. Uh, are you, mm-hmm. it, how much do these values do you derive from uh, religion? Are you uh, no. deeply religious? <laughs> Great or, question. I think a lot of what you're saying to me resonates with a Christian philosophy um, yeah. and perhaps other, I'm not, I didn't mean to zone, hone in specifically on Christian, but Sure, um, you yeah, know, the idea fine. of universal love, you know, Jesus talk, mm-hmm. oh, Jesus would love a lot of what you're saying, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's fair I to think, say, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. I think, you know, it's hard for me to pinpoint. Uh, yeah, I definitely, first of all, uh, derive a lot of what I say from, from religious teachings. I was, I was raised as a Christian. I was, I am firmly settled or nested within the Judeo-Christian ethic and the Judeo-Christian worldview. Um, but I pull from various different uh, faiths in my and the way that I curate content and the way that I have curated my own philosophy. Buddhism being one of them. Um, Judaism, definitely. I've, I've, you know, I studied Jewish philosophy at an institution here in New York, um, and I'm very much rooted in. I, I find that I'm my my moral sense is definitely rooted in the writings of many Jewish teachers and philosophers and rabbis. In addition. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can't see it. He's dancing on the screen right now. Um, in addition to uh, the, the writings of Christian theologians, you know, Terrence Malick is probably my favorite film director, and he's very mm-hmm. much a, a, a Christian filmmaker. Um, but Abraham Joshua Heschel is a is a Jewish rabbi that I relate to. Mayor Soloveitchik is a Jewish rabbi that I relate to. Again, I said earlier that I'm just now getting into Buddhism, so that's that's that'll be a that'll be a journey. Um, I teach a lot of Stoicism as well um, in the theory of enchantment, both through the writings of Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, but also through the lens of the Disney film The Lion King, which I actually consider to be a sacred text. So um, there's a lot there, but yes, to answer your yeah, question, great. Thanks uh, for answering I, it. I appreciate I, it. Yeah, I, I, can, I do your... consider it to be a spiritual exercise. Yeah. So I know it's a really deeply personal question. So thank you for for uh, yeah. being so gracious to answer the question. Connor Eden says, why do we prefer our mythological heroes to be morally ambiguous? For example, not all good, not all bad, like King David or Iron Man, but we Mm -hmm. demand moral purity in our brothers and sisters, especially when they are leaders in the conscious world. I thought this was a terrific question, and I've been Mm -hmm. trying to rack my brain over it as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So this goes to why I believe it's important for us to study pop culture. I think that it's because we see the these mythological stories uh, too too often. We see them as uh, vehicles of escapism. <laughs> um, you know, we go to the movie to watch the Avengers, and um, you know, we read about King David in the Bible, but we don't actually really study what we're reading. I think, and we don't really wrestle with Iron Man. We don't we don't really wrestle with the character of Iron Man. We just we go don't. to the movies, we see the Avengers, and then we move on, right? Um, and and so what I'm trying to get us to do, and especially to young people, is to consider that the things that they gravitate toward have deep lessons, deep wisdom to teach them and to teach us. Um, And so I'm trying to get us to pause and reflect instead of rushing onto the next movie 
um, for purely entertainment purposes. And that, so I think that's why we don't actually take take these mythological teachings seriously, as serious as we should. Fascinating. Okay, so I'm just going to end with two, not questions. You're off the hook with, in terms of questions. You can take a sigh okay. of relief. Um, just some pos- <laughs> positive uh, Twitter comments that are just uh, sure. complimentary. Richard St. Marie said, you are a breath of fresh air and hope regarding the future. And super galactic hippie chick, who I just absolutely adore. <laughs> adore That's this, a great name. This person's oh my handle. I, I, yeah. I love this person's handle. They said, can you tell her thank you for sharing her inspiring her inspiring beauty and brilliance uh, question mark exclamation point <laughs> i am inspired and excited to learn more from her so i just want to end here today with my favorite quotes from you which i thought would really um put a nice ending to this chat we had today will we develop the inner conviction to have compassion for each other this fiercely in spite of our tribal brawls and bickering will we gather the strength of love Coley, I love the work you're doing, and I truly appreciate you coming on the Psychology Podcast today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in on the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. If you can, please add a rating and review on iTunes. I read all the reviews and really appreciate your feedback. Also, for additional exclusive must-listen-to episodes, check out our new Patreon page at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash psychpodcast. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.